All right, so 1 Peter chapter 5, and we're going to look at verses 6 through 11 this morning. And the title of the message is Enduring, Enduring the Storm. All right. So 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 6 through 11. So before we get started, let me go ahead and open up in um, a word of prayer, and then we'll look at this together. Well, Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this time together this morning. We thank you for this beautiful time of worship we had, and uh, just for this time of fellowship. And, you know, this morning we pray that you would speak to us through your word, that you would have your way. Fill us, fill this place with your Holy Spirit, Lord. And I pray, Lord, you help me as well, Lord, that I would decrease and you would increase, Lord. Fill me with your spirit. Help me to bring forth the words, the things you desire me to, to say this morning. We, we love you. We praise you. We thank you for this opportunity to come here and to hear from you. We ask these things in, in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So, you know, it's been said many times, and I'm sure you've heard this many times, um, as Christians, as believers, as followers of Jesus Christ, we're either going into a trial, we're in the middle of a trial, or we're leaving a trial, right? That seems to be kind of like the story or the timeline um, of a believer. But when I think about difficulties, I think about trials, I often think about like the drive-through, fast food drive-through line. I don't know if you guys have been to the fast food drive-through line lately. Um, maybe the exception of Chick-fil-A, because they have, they're pretty organized there. And maybe because, you know, the Lord has his hand upon Chick-fil-A or something. But when you think about going into a trial, it's like when you drive up to the menu and that intercom that never works, right? And you can't hear the person on the other side of the intercom. So there you're going into the trial and then you finally, you place your order and then you make your way to the second window, right? And the trial intensifies because now you have to wait for your food. And um, if you're like me, you, you're always behind that one car where they have, to, they have to look at all the food, they have to check if the food's in there and then they pass the food out to everyone in the car, right? And then they finally take off. And then you make it to the second window, you get your food, and then you can finally leave the line, right? You're leaving the trial, but then you get home and the order is completely wrong, right? And then you're entering into um, your new trial. Well, the truth of the matter is, as we face difficulties, because we're going to face difficulties, right? James tells us to count it all joy, not if, but when we fall, into these various trials, right? And Peter here in this, um, in 1 Peter chapter 5, he reminds us of the solutions that we have as we go through these difficulties and these troubles in our lives. Solutions that we often um, do not utilize in our Christian walk. Now, just a little bit of a background here. We know as believers that when we go through seasons of difficulty, seasons of, of storms and and trials that they can either help us grow or they can help us become bitter, right? And the determination of that comes from how we as Christians are going to approach or deal with those difficulties. Now, this week I was hearing um, a pastor on the radio and I don't remember who it was. I don't know if it was Greg Laurie or if it was, it wasn't Pastor Chuck, it was somebody. And, and they said, I wrote the quote down, but I didn't write their name down. They said, suffering has a way of sharpening your vision, helping you to focus on what really matters in life. It's a testing ground. I feel like God is testing me to see if I really believe the things I've been preaching all these years. So here in this letter, the Apostle Peter, remember this individual whom the Lord called to be a fisher of men, He's writing to Jewish believers that had been facing persecution. And here Peter encourages them and us as well as we read this today to conduct themselves and to conduct ourselves with courage and to persevere in the midst of persecution or difficulties in our lives. And from this, we can certainly learn how to persevere in the midst of whatever you're going through right now. I don't know what you guys are going through. The Lord knows. He knows your heart better than you even know your own heart. Me as well. Um, I don't know what we're going through. Um, but the Lord allows things into our lives for a purpose. And that's something that we have to learn how to deal with. So here in the, in the text, and I'm going to go ahead and read it to you all. And then we'll look at it verse by verse. I'm going to read the second part of verse 5 there in 1 Peter chapter 5. And then I'll work my way into verse 11. So here, uh, Peter writes, he writes, God resists the proud, 
but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that he may exalt you at the proper time, casting all your cares on him because he cares about you. Be sober-minded, be alert. Your adversary, the devil, is prowling around like a roaring lion looking for anyone he can devour. Resist him, firm in the faith, knowing that the same kind of sufferings are being experienced by your fellow believers throughout the world. The God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ will himself restore, establish, strengthen, and support you after you have suffered a little while. To him be dominion forever. Amen. Amen. So notice here in these first few verses, in that second part of verse 5 into verse 6 and verse 7, we have to be humble, right? We have to humble ourselves as we go through these trials and as we go through these difficulties. And often it's that trial, it's that difficulty that will do the humbling, right? It breaks us, it, 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 it shatters us, it brings us to our knees. So if you look here in verse 6, he says, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that he may exalt you at the proper time. So once again, in Peter's time, here, God's saints, these Jewish believers, they were enduring great persecution. Um, but he reminds them here, you know, the Lord has allowed these things into their lives, these difficulties, and they must receive those things humbly. Uh, James tells us in chapter 4, verse 6, that God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. We're also reminded of this in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 34. And as Christians, as believers, we need to be clothed in humility, submitting to God first, and then submitting to one another. Submitting to God and submitting to, to one another. Because the Lord will sustain them and will sustain us, and he will raise or exalt people at the proper time. You see, God never exalts a person until they are ready to be exalted or raised up. And I love what Wearsby says regarding this. He says, first the cross, then the crown, first the suffering, then the glory. And there he's speaking of Jesus Christ, the greatest living example we have, the only living example we have of God the Father, right? Humbled and then exalted at the appropriate time, right? He had to come to this earth and die for our sins, put on the cross, and then came the glory in that order. So there is a purpose for all of this that's going on in the lives of these individuals then, and also in our lives now. As we go from glory to glory, as we read about in the letters to the Corinthians, it takes a lot of shaping, it takes a lot of molding, right, and reliance on the Lord uh, to keep that shape and to keep that, that mold that he's trying to shape us into. So we must humble ourselves in the midst of those difficulties. And in order to submit to the Lord, we have to be humbled, right? We have to be broken, or else we're not going to submit um, to the Lord. And then notice in verse 7 what he tells us to do as we um, are humbling ourselves. So in the process of this, he tells us, he says, Casting all your cares on him because he cares about you. Right, so cast all your cares to him because he cares about you. So what we're told here is to cry out to the Lord, right? To cry out to the Lord, think about this as prayer, right? Crying out to him in prayer. And notice he says, casting our cares, or all your cares. That word cares, if you look it up in the original Greek language, the word is merina, merina. And it's actually translated to anxieties and, and worries and cares. So Peter's telling us to cast those cares and those anxieties to the Lord. Why? Because the Lord cares about us. Now, every time I read this verse, and, and I love this verse, it's a verse, it's interesting, like you love this verse and often you forget like to apply it to your life. Like you hold on to the cares and the anxieties. Um, but every time I read this verse, it, it reminds me of, of, of sports. I automatically think of sports and you know, I, I'm goofy and dorky. I, I wasn't really good at sports. You know, I was in the band. But um, I think of the sports, and I think everyone in here is well aware that a week from today at 4.30 Mountain Time, right, 
Um, the Super Bowl is going to be on TV, right? Super Bowl 56. Um, the LA Rams and the Cincinnati Bengals are going to be battling it out, right? They're going to be facing this battle together. And I can tell you, the winner of that battle is going to be the team with the greatest strategy, okay? And when you think about football, and believe it or not, I know a thing or two about football. It, uh, once again, it was my years in, in marching band. You know, you, you learn about football. But anyways, when you think about football, you think about a football team. Every person on that team wants to be the star player. If you think about our Christian race, the Lord is on our team. And for some reason, we all want to be the star player, but he needs to be the star player. All eyes need to be on the Lord. But often we want to keep the eyes on ourselves, but they need to be on the Lord. And when you think about our anxieties and our worries, it's kind of like the football, right? And what he's telling us here, what Peter is telling us, is we need to throw that football to the star player who is the Lord. Because he's the fastest, he's going to catch it, and he's going to make the touchdown. Not us, right? We're going to drop it. We're going to fumble it. We're going to get tackled at the one-yard line, right? That's us, but not the Lord. And here we have to pass him those anxieties and those worries. And when that football comes back to you of anxieties and worries, what are you supposed to do? Pass it back to the Lord where it belongs. And the problem with us, you know, I know with me, is we like to throw the football of anxieties and worries to everybody else first, and then we throw it to the Lord last. And, you know, why do we do that? What, what is the problem? What is wrong with us, right? Why do we do this? And I, I think a lot of it has to do with, you know, we want to avoid just crying out to the Lord. We want to avoid that time of prayer. And prayer is so important. You know, this is something that's really been on my heart, especially as we've gone into the new year, is I've, I've really wanted to, to pray more. And um, as, as Christians, as believers, that is like one of the most underutilized tools in our, in our walk. You know, you think about prayer gatherings at the church, they're the least attended. You could bring cookies and food and people still won't come. Um, why don't we like to pray? And I think there's a lot of reasons why we don't want to pray, but those are issues that we have to bring to the Lord so he can resolve those for us because we can't resolve those on our own. Um, we have to just surrender to him. But like the game of football, we, we like to throw those anxieties and those worries to everybody else, including the water boy, before we throw them to the Lord. And we have to be careful because the truth of the matter is if we want God's perfect will for our lives, we have to ask God for that perfect will. We can't ask somebody else for that perfect will because only he can give us that because he knows it. No one else does. And it's because typically we, we say to ourselves, oh, you know, I've already asked everybody, you know, I guess I'll go to the Lord now. We always go to the Lord last and we have to be careful and make sure that we always go to the Lord first with those anxieties and those worries, whatever it is. And, and I do want to challenge you all to, to see if you can pray more. Make time to pray to the Lord. You can pray anywhere. You can pray in your car. Don't close your eyes, but pray in the car. Um, you can pray whenever, from wherever, whenever. And um, we don't have to have like this perfect setting for prayer, right? It's, it's just you talking to the Lord. It's this dialogue between the Lord, your communication with the Lord, and he'll speak to you either through his word or he'll speak to you in his ever soft voice or, you know, he'll speak to you through another person. But you've got to cry out to the Lord, as Peter's telling us here, casting those anxieties and those cares to him. And why do we want to do this? Because he cares for us, right? And I think with the trials and the difficulties, you know, the enemy likes to get into our mind. He likes to have us cornered with the anxieties and the worries. And I think a lot of us, we, we say to ourselves, you know, I, I didn't pass the ball to, to the Lord because... Well, he didn't look open, so I didn't throw him the anxieties or the worries, right? Going back to the football analogy. Um, and I think sometimes we think the Lord is too busy for us or to hear from us. But the truth of the matter is, he's not, right? Every single one of you is extremely valuable to the Lord. So the Lord is always open to receive those, that ball of anxiety and worries. Sometimes we think to ourselves that he didn't look like he could make the catch. Oh, it didn't look like he was going to catch my anxiety. He was going to drop it. Right? We sometimes think that our problems are too big for the Lord. But the truth is, the Lord's bigger than any of our problems. And, um, and we forget that. The enemy likes us to forget these things. See, the enemy doesn't want us to pray. He wants us to hold on to those worries and to those anxieties. And, you know, this is something that we've been talking quite a bit, actually, in, at the men's study on Wednesdays, as we've been going through Genesis, 
There's always consequences to our actions. And when we don't cry out to the Lord, there's going to be consequences. And, and I think it was a few weeks ago, we were talking about Abram, right? Um, there in chapter 12 in the book of Genesis, if you remember, Abram had made it to the promised land. And then his faith was tested, right? This famine had hit the land. And that caused him to make his way south into Egypt, a land, a place that he had no business being in, a place that had not been promised to him. And he makes his way down to Egypt. And um, if you remember, he, there with his wife Sarai, later to be named Sarah, um, she's very beautiful. And he tells her in his own plan as he's making his way south to Egypt. If you look there in verse 12 of Genesis chapter 12, he says, when the Egyptians see you, he's speaking to Sarai, his wife, they will say, this is his wife. They will kill me, but let you live. Please say you are my sister, so it will go well for me because of you, and my life will be spared on your account. Now, in that portion of scripture there, as he's making his way to Egypt, and while he's in Egypt, nowhere in there does it say that he cried out to the Lord. However, before he made his way to Egypt, when he was in the promised land, and then when he made his way back to um, Canaan from Egypt, back into the promised land, there he does cry out to the Lord. So what we see here is Abram is using these carnal weapons to fight a spiritual battle with Pharaoh. Had he been crying out to the Lord, he probably would have never left the promised land south into Egypt. But because of this, what we see is that eventually Abram gets kicked out of Egypt and he makes his way back um, to that promised land that the Lord had promised him. And I think we can really learn from that. But I think especially what we can learn from or whom we can learn from is, is Jesus Christ, right? The only living example we have uh, of God the Father. And this is actually something we've been talking a lot about in the youth study as we've been going to the Gospel of Luke there. But if you remember, um, Jesus, there in the Gospel of Luke, it speaks a lot of his prayer life. You think about Jesus and like he prayed at his baptism. He prayed before choosing the 12. He prayed. He would get away and pray often. He prayed for Peter. He prayed for his persecutors. And he took time to get away and to spend time with the Father. He took that time to pray. And I often think about that agonizing prayer that he prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, if you remember there, on the night before he was betrayed, um, he prayed this prayer, not once or twice, but three times, if you read there, in the Gospel of Matthew, in chapter 26. And if you remember there, uh, Jesus, beginning in verse 36 of Matthew 26, it says, Then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane and said to the disciples, Sit here while I go and pray over there. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. Then he said to them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch with me. He went a little farther and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O oh, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. It moves mountains. It makes the things that were impossible to us uh, possible because God is so good. And just like take that time to get away and to give him those anxieties, give him those worries, because when we hold on to those things, the enemy can use those to corner us and to isolate us, to separate us um, from the Lord. And we don't want to be in that, in that circumstance. You see, God is bigger than all of our problems. Jeremiah 32, 17 says, Oh, Lord God, behold, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and outstretched arm. There is nothing too hard for you. So notice here that Peter also tells us, you know, why we want to cast these anxieties, these worries to the Lord. And here he says it's because he cares for us, right? And we understand as believers that the Lord doesn't just care about us, but he loves us. He loves us. There's no greater love than to send your only begotten son to die for the sins of all of humanity, right? And the fact that the Lord loves us so much to do that um, should indicate to us that he cares about us, right? That we're able to give him these, these anxieties and these worries. And because of this, you know, we have everlasting life because of his love towards us. 
And no one can love us like the Lord does. Okay, nobody on this earth. And I'm always telling the young people, if you ever feel like you're not loved, you're alone, remember how valuable you are to the Lord. All of us are valuable to the Lord, and he loves us more than anyone could love us. Even our own parents, right? They can't love us like God does. Ma Matthew 6, 25 through 27. Here the Lord says, Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, um, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Which of you by worrying can add a cubit to his stature? And it's Matthew uh, chapter 6, 25 through 27. So even though we cast our cares to the Lord, we throw him that football, um, the Lord doesn't always answer our prayers in the way that we desire him to answer our prayers, right? But the truth is, the Lord always has something that's better for us. And um, you see, the Lord is always teaching us something, isn't he? He's always teaching us something. And some of you don't know this about me. Maybe most of you do. Some of you do. Uh, several years ago, um, I was actually not living here. I was living in Colorado at the time. I was in graduate school at the time. Um, I, I started to deal with some health issues. Um, I started to have a lot of headaches, a lot of migraines, and then suddenly a lot of dizziness started to... to accompany um, those symptoms and I remember that was like four or five years ago um, I saw like 12 or 12 to like 15 doctors there in Colorado they sent me to the Mayo Clinic in Minnesota they couldn't figure out what was wrong with me um, I was in a position where I was trying to determine whether I was actually sick or if I was actually like losing my mind um, some of them thought it was psychological and um, I knew I was sick though and Eventually, they found, they found a tumor in my head. It was a tumor. It was the size of a pea, about three inches in from my forehead. It's still in there. So that's what's wrong with me. Um, so the tumor's in there, and um, it caused all this grief. It caused all these issues. And, and by the grace of God, through physical therapy and medications for the dizziness and the headaches, I've, I've been symptom-free. I was symptom-free for several years. Um, unfortunately, recently, some of those symptoms have started to come back. Um, the tumor grew a little bit. Now it's like the size of a dime. It had a bleed recently, but it's inside the tumor. Um, so I'll likely have to have that removed at some point. Um, but anyways, going through that season a few years ago and kind of entering into that season again now with, with some of the symptoms and, and just some of those changes, um, I often think of the Apostle Paul. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, if you remember there, the Apostle Paul, he speaks of this thorn he has in his flesh, right? And remember that thorn had been given to him in order to above measure. And if you remember, the Apostle Paul, he had had this awesome, grandiose experience. He had this vision of what he called the third heaven, right? He had this concerning this thorn it had been given to him to keep him from, from being exalted or from being prideful. And if you remember there, in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 8, there, Paul, he pleaded with the Lord, it says here, three times that he would take that thorn away from him. And if you study those verses, you know, some scholars suggest that that was, he was probably using a Hebrew figure of speech where three times actually means continuously. So maybe Paul was continuously asking the Lord to take this thorn away from him. And, and certainly, I have asked the Lord many, many times to take this away from me, too. Um, of course, Paul's suffering does not compare to like what I've, what I've gone through. Right? Paul's gone through some more severe things than I've gone through. Um, but just like Paul, what I've learned from the Lord is sometimes the Lord will remove the load completely. right? And it's kind of like he takes it away and like you don't worry about it anymore. But then sometimes he just strengthens you so you can bear the load. So you're still going through the load, but you're able to bear it. And, and that's, that's what he's done for me. And I love what Paul tells us here in this portion of scripture because um, concerning the thorn, like he had asked the Lord to take it away from him, but then the Lord answers him differently. He didn't take it away from him. 
he gives them what he needs to bear the load while it's still there. He says there in chapter 12 of 2 Corinthians, verse 10, he says, And he said to me, the Lord is speaking to Paul, My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions and distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then um, I am strong. So it's when we are so weak that all you can do is rely. And that is like the safest place to be. And I know for me, um, you know, in that time, I had to make peace with the fact that I would rather feel, you know, sick and dizzy and be in fellowship with the Lord than to be well and fully believing in our hearts and declaring that number one, Jesus died for our sins that Jesus was buried, and that Jesus rose from the dead three days later, right? When we put our faith in that message, there's an element of repentance in our lives, right? There needs to be a change in our lives, right? We ask the Lord to come into our lives and to change us by the power and the person of the Holy Spirit. That, in the book of Romans, tells us, uh, makes us righteous in the sight of the Lord. But when you think about God's grace, um, you know, it's the grace that we have every single day through Jesus Christ. And that grace should be enough it should be sufficient for us like it was for paul like it has been for me and i'm sure it's been for many of you in this room as you've gone through difficulties in your own life whatever it is i'm sure god's grace has taken you through that to bear the load because maybe he hasn't taken the load away from you um completely he's using that thorn in your life to keep you in fellowship with him and um and i love that because because we're with him even in the midst of suffering and difficulty um, in verse 8 and 9, notice that Peter continues, and he says, Be sober-minded, be alert. Your adversary, the devil, is prowling around like a roaring lion, looking for anyone he can devour. Resist him, firm in the faith, knowing that the same kind of suffering throughout the world. Uh, so notice here that, you know, in addition to casting those things to the Lord, we also have to be sober-minded and we have to be vigilant. We have to be well aware of the tactics of the enemy. And if you look at John chapter 10, verse 10, there speaking of the enemy, it says, The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. And it says, I have come, this is speaking of the Lord, that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly and i know for many of us the tactics of the enemy might be different the things that you struggle with the things that you used to be used to be your stronghold the enemy can use those things to reel you in and to pull you away from the lord and those things keep you from submitting to the lord but peter reminds us here that you know the enemy he is prowling around like it says here like a roaring lion right he wants to gulp god's people up that's what he wants to do and in the midst of persecution in that time, these individuals, this is what Peter's warning them about. But of course, for us now, it could be persecution. Maybe you're going through persecution, or maybe you're just going through a difficult season. The enemy can use that to eat you alive, and we have to be very careful. Now, remember, going back to, going back to the whole football analogy, the enemy is not on our team, guys. He's on the opposite team. And when you're holding on to those anxieties and those worries, you're holding on to that football, the opposing team is going to come after you even more so. So that's why we have to get rid of that ball and give it to the Lord. Because he can only fight the enemy for us, right? We're too weak. James 4, 7 tells us to submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from us. But you see, we have to do it in that order. You have to first submit to God, then you can resist the devil, and then the devil will flee from us. You can't resist the devil first and then submit to God. It's not possible that way. You have to first submit to God, and then you can resist the devil, and then the devil will flee from us. Ladies, and your worries to everybody else, but you're not giving it to the Lord, then there, in a sense, what you're doing is you're trying to resist. And this is actually something I learned very quickly in that time that I was facing these health issues back in Colorado. And when I first began feeling sick, in a sense, I was giving those anxieties and those worries to the doctors. I was putting my faith in doctors and not so much in the Lord. And my faith was greatly shaken. And we have to be careful because when we start putting our faith 
elsewhere, we're not putting our faith in the Lord, we're going to put ourselves in a very dangerous position or a very dangerous situation because then the enemy can start messing with our minds. And when you think about the word of God, you know, we have many examples of this happening. You think of Judas Iscariot, right? The betrayer, putting his faith in money, putting his faith in those high priests, and that separated him from God. And this led to his spiritual and eventually his physical death as well. Uh, you think of King Solomon, um, an individual that was greatly, greatly, greatly blessed by the Lord, right? Um, he was blessed with great wisdom. He was blessed with wealth and power. Um, he started well out of great obedience to the Lord. And unfortunately, he began to put his trust and his faith in the worldly possessions that he had. He surrounded himself with luxury and was oppressive and eventually um, lust led him to idolatry. I mean, this guy had 700 wives, 300 concubines. There was something wrong with this guy. And you think about the punishment that came to him. Remember there, several tribes that were promised to the descendants of David uh, were taken away and given to one of his servants. Of course, the Lord spared David in, in a sense where he, he waited to the generation after Solomon for this to take place. But the takeaway message here, when you think about Judas and King Solomon, is when we start putting our faith in things other than the Lord, um, we're going to be headed for a fall very, very quickly. Um, in the Lord. And what I've learned, um, particularly with my own health, um, is that the Lord is the great physician. Medical science, and I can say this because I'm a scientist, I, I guess I was classically trained as a scientist, science can give you answers, but at the end of the day, God will always have the last word. And when you think about surgery, think about surgery, when you have surgery, right, the surgeon is the one who performs the surgery. And he or she is going to use medical tools to perform the surgery, whether it's a, uh, a scalpel or whatever tools they need uh, to perform the surgery. But during the surgery, you put your trust in the surgeon, right? You don't put your trust on the scalpel or like the medical tools that that surgeon's using. And likewise, when you think about our Christian walk, the Lord is the one who's going to be the surgeon. And he'll use medical tools, whether it's doctors or any type of healthcare individual to, to work through, to perform that surgery. And we put our faith in the surgeon. Our faith is in the Lord, not necessarily those doctors. And at the end of the surgery, we thank the surgeon, right? We don't thank the scalpel, um, so we thank the Lord. I mean, we want to thank the doctors too, but really it's the Lord who's performing that surgery on you, using these, these earthly vessels, tools as instruments um, for his glory. So our faith needs to be above. It needs to be um, on the Lord. Because when we take it off the Lord, just like these individuals that we talked about here, um, we're going to be headed um, for a fall. We have to be careful. Um, notice in verse 9, um, Peter continues and he says, he says, resist him firm in the faith, knowing that the same kind of sufferings are being experienced by your fellow believers um, throughout um, the world. So we're not to surrender to the enemy's fury. We're not to, um, you know, surrender to him. We're supposed to resist him is what the word of God is telling us here. And I think it's so easy uh, to fall into the trap where when we're going through a very difficult time in our lives that we start to feel sorry for ourselves and we think that we're the only person on the, like on the planet that's going through that circumstance. And we have to be careful of that because that can allow us to, to become isolated again. And we have to understand that there are many saints before us, many people before us that have experienced and are going through similar things that we are going through. And what I love about the Lord is that in our own lives, as he's teaching us these lessons, as we're going through these difficult times, he can use those through us to minister to other people as they are also going through those difficult times. And in fact, if you look at 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 4, here the Apostle Paul, he writes, um, He comforts us in all our affliction, so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any kind of affliction through the comfort we ourselves received um, from God. So this is actually very important. 
Um, when I read this, when I think about this, I think about fellowship. Fellowship is extremely important in the body of Christ. Brothers and sisters in Christ, we, we need each other. We need each other. And this is something that I greatly learned. I think maybe a lot of us learned a lot about in 2020. Um, I think that was a year of great isolation for a lot of us, right? Being away from, from maybe brothers and sisters in Christ. Um, I, I guess meeting remotely, uh, it's not the same thing, right, than meeting in person with somebody. But I know for in 2020, which was a very difficult year for me personally, um, that, that loss of fellowship wa was heavy on, on my walk with the Lord. It can, cause, it can cause issues. And, you know, especially when you think about accountability and, and all these things, you need brothers and sisters in Christ there to help you. And I know in my life, you know, I, I know about everyone in this room, um, even if I've just met you, the Lord has used everyone in my walk. And, and I'm grateful for that. All the fellowship is so important to me. And, um, and I always tell the young, the young people this, you know, you, you, you have brothers and sisters in Christ that are going through the same things you're going through. It's important that you talk to each other and you, and you express these things and you pray for one another. And, you know, I'm, I'm glad that, you know, we, we do this in the men's group and, and you know, the small groups are very important. But just checking in on each other, it, it, it's a very important thing. Um, but like I said, we can use each other. Because I bet you there's somebody in your circle that is probably going through, going through something that you've already been through or maybe you're going through yourself. And they can help you, you Lord, right? We need to resist the devil, and fellowship is, is one of those ways of doing it. And when you think about resisting the devil, um, submitting to the Lord, we have all the tools, we have all those instruments, right? We have the Word of God, and our faith comes by hearing, and hearing comes by the Word of God. So we have His Word. We have the power and the person of the Holy Spirit, right? The Holy Spirit will always give us the desire, the will, and the ability um, to do the things that the Lord desires us to do. And of course, we have prayer, right? We've been talking about this a little bit here. As we cry out to the Lord, that's our communication um, with the Lord. That's how we express it. He already knows what's going on in our lives, but he wants to hear us ask him for these things, right? And of course, if we ask it in accordance to his will, he will always answer um, our prayers, right? And then, of course, the fellowship is very important um, to encourage one another. The edification of the church is um, it's essential, there's so much division in the world right now. The church is the last place where you want to see division. And that's why we have to keep the focus on Jesus Christ. Because there's a lot of divisiveness with some of the non-essential things, like the gifts, the tribulation, all these things, which are important. But really, the focus needs to be on Jesus Christ, because only He's going to save us, nothing else. So, in terms of submission to the Lord, um, I truly believe it has a lot to do with love how much we love the Lord, right? And if you don't love someone, you're not going to submit to them. You're not going to listen to them. You're not going to do the things he or she is desiring you to do. But in the case of the Lord, if we love the Lord enough, and when I say love, what I'm talking about is that agape love, that love that is only possible and manifest, it manifests through the power and the person of the Holy Spirit, that is the love that we need to have towards the Lord in order to submit to the Lord. If you look at Matthew chapter 6, 24, remember this. No one can serve two masters, since either he will hate one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise um, the other. So we have to love the Lord more than anything to submit to him. And I know that that is easier said than done, because when we wake up in the morning, automatically in the flesh, we don't want to submit to the Lord. We want to submit to ourselves and do the things that we want to do. So this is a continuing battle for, I know for me and I know for all of us, it's not something that you just resolve in the morning. Sometimes it's something you have to resolve throughout the day, right? Every minute, every 10 minutes, I don't know. It could be one of those days. Um, but the Lord has given us all those tools and those instruments um, to do that. All right, notice here in verse 10, um, he says, the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ will himself restore, establish, strengthen, and support you after you have suffered um, a little while. All right, so here in, in verse 10, notice that Peter reminds us that trials that are allowed into our lives, they're not there to punish us, right? Um, they're allowed out of love and out of the eternal glory 
to come. And it's kind of like what I said earlier with James, right, in the epistle um, that James wrote there. Um, we have to count it all joy when we fall into these various trials. Not if, but when we do, because the Lord's using those things to make us better, to look more like his son Jesus. And um, when you think about trials and difficulties, whatever it is you're going through right now, uh, we have to remember that it's only going to last for a little bit. It's going to be painful for a little bit, but, you know, the glory that is to come, that's going to be eternal. And that's what we look forward to. And um, unfortunately, this week, I, I, I got sick in the middle of the week. I, I have to go to the doctor. It's not COVID, thank God. Um, it was a sinus infection, you know, because there's, there's other things out there, right? Um, but anyways, I went to the doctor, and um, it's like when you get a shot at the doctor. So they gave me a shot. Um, it hurts, right, when they poke you with the needle, but it doesn't hurt for a long time, right? It hurts for a little bit. You know, for me, of course, it hurt the whole day. But anyways, they poke you with the needle, and they inject you with the medication, whatever it is, you know, an antibiotic. Um, so they gave me, yeah, they gave me an antibiotic. And, um, and once the medication's in your body, it gets into your bloodstream, um, you know, you start to feel better, right? So it's kind of like that. You know, you have this, you're going through this situation, but it's only going to hurt for a little bit. But then the glory to come, that's, gonna, that's going to be eternal. So that's what you focus on. You don't focus on the pain that you're going, in, going through right now. Um, what you focus on is what's God, what God is trying to teach you and what that glory looks like in the future. So remember what Paul tells us in Romans chapter 8, verse 18. Um, he writes there, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is going to be um, revealed um, to us. And every single day, um, the Lord is molding us. He's shaping us as he desires. Okay? Um, the Lord is the potter, guys. We are his clay. Second Corinthians, um, there Paul refers to us as these weak earthen vessels, right? We're these weak earthen vessels. And um, the Lord is shaping us. He's molding us. And um, I don't know if, if you all have ever made pottery before. I don't know if you've taken a pottery class or, or maybe you've just tried making pottery. Um, but when you make like when you mold, put it into the oven and you, it has to go through what is called the firing process. That way the clay can, can bond at the, like the microscopic level. So like us, uh, as the Lord's clay, as we are shaped and molded through the trials and the difficulties, as we're going through the fire, in a sense, we're gonna, ge we're gonna keep that shape that he's shaping us into as we go through that trial. So it, it, it solidifies us in our walk with the Lord as he continues to shape us and mold us. Um, but it, it's this continuous firing process, right? It's, um, it's these various trials that we're going to be going through. But at the end of the day, we're going to look more like he does. And that's what we look to, not the firing process that we're going through right now. However, that firing process becomes a part of our lives, right? We can use that to help people. It becomes a part of our testimony. And every single day, when I wake up in the morning, I remind myself that it's like a day closer to that glory, right? Seeing the Lord face to face. And that's what, that's what I look forward to. And I'm sure that's what everyone here is looking forward to as well. Um, but notice here um, that there are four things that Peter lists in verse 10 as we're going through this process with the Lord. Notice he says that it restores us, right? These difficulties, they restore us. And when you think about the, the hard times in our lives, they make us fit. They supply the needed elements in the Lord's character to make us um, spiritually mature. So we're maturing spiritually in these difficult times as he's restoring us, right? Going back to that firing process with the clay. Also, it says that um, he establishes us, right? Suffering, it makes us more stable, okay? Um, able to maintain a good confession, and to bear up under, under pressure. So when we go through future difficulties, we can remember that, and it'll help us to be stable in those times as well, right? Because we're already established. And then also, thirdly, he says that these things strengthen us, right? The persecution, the difficulties are intended by Satan to weaken and to wear people out. But in Christ, it's the opposite effect, okay? It strengthens us um, to endure. Okay, planted and sick and his word. And when I think about, you know, specifically supporting us, I was thinking about, about this because, you know, it snowed this weekend. Um, my, my, my parents have a tree in their yard. It's, it's a young tree and it was like, it was like falling over. 
And when you think about it, a young plant or a tree that you plant, like you have to stake it to the ground, right? So like before the roots, so the roots can get strong. So like you tie the tree down. So when you think about like a tree, it needs that support uh, with the stakes, but you, you have to let the tree move a little bit because if you stake it too tight, like the tree's not gonna move and then the roots are not gonna be able to like grab onto the soil medium, right? So you have to let it loose a little bit, but the trials, the, diffi the difficulties in our lives, they, they, they support us, the Lord's supporting us, but at the same time, we're, we're gaining um, footage as far as like the roots in a tree would, right? So we're, we're becoming firmly planted as the Lord is using those things in our lives. So these four things here, as Peter lists, are, um, are some of the outcomes that we see during, during those difficult times. And I think um, when you see this, you realize, oh yes, this is a blessing that we're going through these things. It's hard to say that right in a difficult time. But God uses everything. Nothing is ever wasted in Christ Jesus. Um, and then notice here in verse 11, um, Peter continues and he says to him, be dominion forever. Amen. And, um, you know, all the, all the difficulties that we face, everything that we're going to go through in this life, it's, it's for his purpose. It's for Christ's sake. And that's something we need to remember. And by the grace of God, as we make it through the difficulties and the trials, he's the one that's going to be glorified, right? We're not the ones that are glorified. It's the Lord who is, is glorified. He is that star player, right? It's not us. It's him that all the eyes need to be um, focused on. Okay? So... In closing this morning, there are four things I want us to take away from this text specifically. Um, number one, God allows trials into our lives, but at the same time, in complete control of those trials. Okay? So God allows trials into our lives, and he's in complete control of those trials. Uh, secondly, God enables us to bear our trials. Okay? But we first need to recognize how insufficient we are in ourselves and surrender to him, right? And this is why we have to throw that ball of anxieties and worries to the Lord. Um, thirdly, God will deliver us from our trials. And even if he doesn't deliver you in the way that you wish he would, he's still going to deliver you because at the end of the day, what God has for us is better than we could even think we want for ourselves, right? And... The thing is, as he delivers us from those difficulties in the way he desires, a lot of times we don't even remember necessarily the details of the difficulty, but we, we remember what he taught us in the difficulty, and that becomes a part of our lives. It becomes a part of our testimony. It becomes a part of our, our living letter of recommendation um, for the faith. Okay? And then fourthly, God is glorified through our trials, as I, as I already mentioned. Right? They're all for his purpose. He is glorified. All the eyes are focused on him. Not me, not you. All the victory goes, um, it, it goes to the Lord. Now, I don't know what difficulties you all are facing right now. Um, what I do know is that all of us, we're going through something right now, right? We're all always going through something. And um, I want you to remember Jesus, okay? Remember on the night before he was put on the cross? There he was in the Garden of Gethsemane casting his anxieties to the Lord, his Father. Uh, remember what he said. He said, if it is possible, pass from me. They're speaking of the cross. But then he said, Jesus says, nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Surrendering to all that prayer was going to be answered. And we all know how that prayer was answered. And I'm so grateful, and I love the Lord so much for his willingness to surrender to the will of his Father. Because of that, all of us in this room who have called upon the name of the Lord. We have hope and we have a future. And let me close with this from 2 Corinthians 4, 17 through 18. It says, For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Amen. So if you um, are joining us here in person, or maybe you're watching um, via the live stream, uh, maybe you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, we want to give you that opportunity this morning. Uh, maybe you're going through a difficult time. Maybe you are going through a season in your life where you just don't know what to do. You need peace. You need hope. 
Um, your solution is Jesus Christ. We want to give you that opportunity to receive him into your life this morning. So if that's you um, watching via the live stream or maybe here in person, um, if we could all close our eyes, bow our heads. And if that's you this morning, if you could repeat this prayer after me. Well, Heavenly Father, this morning I want to invite you into my life as my Lord and Savior. And uh, this morning I want to declare Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. And Lord, this morning I, I, I believe that Jesus is your son. I believe that he died for my sins. I believe that he was buried. And I believe that he rose from the dead three days later. I also recognize that I am a sinner. I am in need of a Savior. Please forgive me of my sins. I pray that your Holy Spirit would come into my life, change my heart, and use me for your glory. Amen. If you prayed that this morning, um, we want to welcome you to the kingdom of God. And um, if you're watching via the live stream, you want to get connected, you want to find out where you can go to church, uh, we, can, we can help you with that. You can contact the church. We can direct you to a Bible teaching church, even if it's not this one. If you need a Bible, anything like that. Or we would invite you also to come visit us in person. We meet every Sunday at 10 a.m. for worship. We are located at the corner of Hondo Pass and um, Gateway South here in Northeast El Paso. And um, we want to thank you so much for your time this morning. And um, we're, we're praying for you. We love you. And we hope to see you um, again soon.